Okay, we ready? Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, says this. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things we have done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, so this is a, a passage that I love to read at funerals because it reminds us all that there is something greater that we have beyond this. Now, we're going to take a little different um, approach to this passage and in fact, we're going to be talking about something that in some ways you may say, why are we talking about this in church? This is really not the spiritual. But I want to say this this morning. Death is a part of life. Death will come to all of us. Years ago, there was a woman, a reporter, she was young, she was just starting out, and she ended up going to interview an older gentleman who was prominent, who was well known, but now he had a terminal disease and he was in the hospital dying. And she went there and she was talking to him and asking him some questions. And then she finally asked the question, sir, what's it like to know that you're dying? And without skipping a beat, he said, What's it like to pretend that you're not? You see, the fact is, is that all of us are dying. Tomorrow, we will be a day closer to our earthly tent leaving this world. In fact, these statistics are rather staggering. But when you think that we have around 7 billion people in this world, you may not be surprised when you hear this. Today, approximately 150,000 people will die in the world. 150,000 people. And, and this is not a political, this is not a scare task, tactic. COVID has not really added a whole lot to that number. Uh, it hovers somewhere, COVID cases are somewhere around 2,500 worldwide, 3,500, so about less than 2% of, of the cases right now. So this is not just flat across the board on any given day, 100, 150,000 people will die. So I'm a numbers guy. I like to do numbers. I like to think about numbers. And so a number that you might find interesting is that there's about 84,000 seconds in a day. Do a little bit more math and approximately two people die every second. 
two people die every second. Now, we could bring that down. Well, how many is that in America or how many is that in New Mexico or how many is that in Lee County or even in Hobbs? But the fact is, is that people are dying. I'm not proud of this, but this is something that I, I can tell you as a fact. Over the past 22 years in ministry, I have done funerals for all ages. I've done a funeral for a premature baby born and lived just a few days. And there's nothing like seeing a casket this big right in front. I've done a funeral for a toddler, for a teenager, for a young parent, for middle-aged, for near retirement, and for 70s, 80s, and 90s. For men and for women, for husbands and for wives, brothers, sisters, grandparents, grandmothers, aunts and uncles, even children. And one thing that I've learned from this is that death is real. Not just the number that we throw out of 150,000 or two per second, but the reality is, is all of us are dying. Death is a part of life. And so there's one question I want to ask, and there's two different ways that I really want to go with this. My first and main question is this, is what are you doing about it? A couple of years ago, we were surprised at Christmas to learn that we were invited to go with the rest of my family on a trip to Hawaii. And I've never been to Hawaii. I think I've been on the beaches of Galveston, and I don't know that that counts as a beach. But as soon as we heard about that, I got out my phone and I pulled up an app that would start counting down the days until we were going to go. And as we got closer and closer, I decided several things. I'm going to learn everything there is to know about Pearl Harbor. Because I cannot wait to go to Pearl Harbor and look at all of this and see the memorials. And I want to know everything there is to know about what took place on that day in December decades ago. And the second thing I said was... I want to be in the best shape of my life. So when I get out on that beach, I don't look like a 45-year-old guy. Actually, I would have been 44. Well, many of you know the story. COVID hit and our trip, our plan got postponed. And that's a good thing because I didn't shed all the pounds that I wanted to. And I don't have the beach body I was hoping to have. So I bought myself maybe another six months or 18 months until we have that opportunity. But there were plans. I wanted to be ready to go. I was thinking about all the things that we would get to do to be with my family, to spend time with my brothers. I don't get to see that often in their family. It was something that was really exciting. But I wonder how much of us plan for our death. And so one aspect of it, which we talk about quite often, and honestly, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this morning, is the spiritual aspect of it. Spiritually, are you prepared? I just visited with someone a, a few moments ago who is going through a difficult time, and they said that as they were uh, struggling with, with an, an illness, they said they, they, they were laying down and falling asleep and with all the things that were going on they said the one thing that kept going over in my mind was safe in the arms of Jesus and my prayer is that you recognize that we are safe in the arms of Jesus not because you're sitting in a purple pew on Sunday morning but because Jesus died to be your savior and that is by his grace that we can read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we can hear about 150,000 people dying and say, you know what? God is still in control and he's got something planned that I'm going to give up my earthly tent for an eternal dwelling. 
But this morning, we're going to take a different approach. And for some of you, you may be saying, well, you're really kind of wasting my time. And maybe I am, but, but maybe I'm not. Because as a minister, I've had an opportunity to be around families as they deal with losing a loved one. And one of the things that always amazes me is that so many people are really unprepared for life after death. Okay, so don't get confused here. I'm not suggesting that there's some spiritual card that you have to have punched in order to be prepared for life after death. Really what I'm talking about is, are you prepared for life after a death? And have you prepared your family for life after your death? And I know you may say, well, what does this have to do with spirituality? Um, I have seen families just torn to pieces over what happens in the weeks following the death of a loved one. I'll give you just uh, one example, and, and we'll have others later on. But a good friend of mine, I'll say his name is George. He lives in Texas. And George was close to his aunt, um, but she didn't uh, have any children herself. Uh, but she also had another sister who was really uh, close to her. Well, George's aunt passed away, and George was in his early 60s, so she was in her uh, late 70s, I believe. And in her will, she really only left a couple of things. She, for her sister, who she was somewhat close to, she left all the contents of her house. And for George, much to his surprise, when the will was read, he learned that his sweet aunt had given uh, him her house. Now, George had taken care of himself and he was good with business. It wasn't something he was expecting. It was something that he needed. But to him, it was really special that, that she would do something uh, like that for him. And so he spoke with his other aunt and uh, said, hey, you know, I, take your time, get whatever you want, and when you're done, let me know, and then I'll go in and, and get that house ready. The, the plan was to sell it. So several weeks pass, and finally he gets the news that it's time for him to, to uh, take ownership of the, the house. And so he goes in, he opens up the door, and he is surprised to what he sees. Nothing. You see, what he didn't realize is that the other heir to the estate was bitter and angry that they didn't get the house that they felt like they deserved. So in order to get back at George and say, I deserved more of this than I actually got, they took everything. Lights, ceiling fans, they couldn't get the cabinets off the kitchen walls, so they took the cabinet doors. How angry do you have to be that you would rip a toilet out of a bathroom and carry a used toilet, which I don't, what do you do with that used toilet? And so he walked into a house that was missing light switches, cabinet doors, lights, it was bare. I guess they decided to leave the sheetrock because it was too much trouble. Can you imagine how that affected the relationship? George had no idea that being willed this house would cause such a rift between him and another aunt. This is one of literally thousands and thousands and thousands of stories that happen every single day. And there's a couple of reasons why this happens. And this is what I, I feel like I've, I've kind of learned over a few years of watching this. There's really three factors that happen when you lose a loved one. 
The first one is, all of a sudden, every decision becomes monumental. Every decision that you make becomes super, super important. Decisions that didn't seem like a big deal a few days ago now are really, really big deals. I have seen grown women argue and fight over what daddy's favorite suit was and what he should be buried in. I've seen arguments take place over the the type and style of coffin that the loved one was going to be buried in. I've heard them talk about, well, you know, the daddy's favorite color was red because he had this red Corvette when he was younger, and so we need to put him in a red tie. And another one say, no, no, but my daughter gave daddy this tie a couple years ago, and he said that it was his favorite tie in the world. And I just know that he would want to be buried in that tie. And you literally have people arguing and fighting over some of the smallest things because now they become so big. The second reason why it's such a pressure cooker is now all of a sudden, not only do you have lots of decisions and the decisions seem really important, but most of these decisions have to take place in a very, very short time. You have just a small window in which you have to decide we need to do this and this and this and this. And I'm really not the right person to be talking about this. I see this on the outset. And I don't want to put a spotlight on my, my friend, but I will. And, and if he wants to talk about this, he could. But Scotty Holloman probably knows a whole lot more about this than I do. He sees, as an attorney, he's probably seen a whole lot more about how families and feuds break out. And I'm not talking about the fun game show we watch on TV. Like, it is, it's awful. But I've, I've witnessed some of these things. And so we have questions that all of a sudden they seem really important. Secondly, we have a very limited amount of time. Okay. Uh, third, I guess there's really four things. Third is, there's a, everyone is overly emotional. And maybe this goes a little bit back to the first one. But I have seen lines drawn where people say, no, this is how it has to be. And people argue over what songs are going to be sung, or who's going to sing them, or where the funeral is going to be out. It needs to be done in a chapel, or it has to be done in a church, but it has to be done in this church, and it can't be done in that church. And I have just seen people argue and fight over things like that. And then the last factor is, is the one person that you want to ask is not there to answer any of those questions. For many of you, you have seen this. Now, some families have done a beautiful job. But I've seen a decent percentage of families that have struggled at best. I've seen families that as a result, they would stop talking to each other. There is one family that I love and adore and have admired for years. And at the funeral of the parent, I watched a rift begin and to this point has not healed. And I think so much about that godly family, that father and mother who loved their children and they loved the Lord. And and if they had any tears to weep, they would be weeping as they watched their family just tear themselves apart because of some really silly things. And so why are we talking about this this morning? Well, one, it's kind of embarrassing, embarrassingly a pet of mine. I took a class years and years ago on ministry and grieving, and this is something that was talked about. And since then, we were when I, every place I've been since then, I've, I've tried to do a seminar or every once in a while, about six or seven years ago, actually it's probably eight years ago now, 
Uh, we talked about this in our, our class back in the quads. That seems like 20 years ago. You hadn't been stuck with me that long, but it was a long time ago. And I was just talking with uh, one of our elders a couple days ago, and I thought, you know what? It's actually several weeks ago. Uh, and I, I thought, maybe it's time that we have a kind of a quick refresher on this. And the reason why I want to do this is because I don't believe that as human beings, we can separate different areas of our life. Okay, as much as I would love for us to say, you know, this is, this is my social life, and this is my academic life, and this is my spiritual life, and this is my financial life, and this is my relational life. This is what our kids love to do, and honestly, they're doing a really, really bad job of it. Um, but they try, they like to do it. That's, that's, that's why social media is so uh, addictive to them, because all of a sudden, they can take away the junk of, Things aren't going well at school and things aren't going well at home, but I can put online and, and put a filter on my face and all of a sudden I'm going to look very different and all of a sudden I can show the best part of me and they can pretend like all this behind them really doesn't matter. But the fact is, is that God created us in a way that spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically, we're all tied together. And that if there's one issue that we're struggling in relationally, then it's going to affect other areas of our life. If you don't believe me, there are some people in here who have been struggling with a bad relationship, whether it be with a, a spouse or an ex-spouse or a child or a brother or sister. And if you spend enough time with them, they'd probably tell you, yeah, that affects every aspect of my life. In fact, statistically, there's probably somebody in this room who's so deeply hurt by what took place at the loss of a loved one and the after effects of it, that they're still walking around with scars because of it. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time this morning, and I want to uh, reintroduce you to a resource uh, that I have shared with you once before, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. And I just want to encourage you uh, to be um, open towards this. Uh, for those of you uh, who have loved ones, I want to encourage you to share this resource with them. It's an awkward conversation to have, but I think it's one that's worth having. If you have parents who are still alive, I want to encourage you to have a conversation with them about what we're about to talk about. And just, just so you know, I've had this conversation with both of my parents, uh, which I'm, I'm young, or I want to pretend that I am, and so I'll pretend that my parents are still young, but the fact is, is that uh, it's important to have this conversation. And so we're going to be talking about uh, a thing called My Love List. How many of you, does anybody remember this from several years ago? Did anybody fill one of these out? I don't, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, I, I want to talk, I, you put your name at the top. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this, why I think this is important, and why I think it is important to take your time this morning to talk about it. Because I believe that one of these can help you and your family and your legacy spiritually. And I think if you are unprepared, I think it can affect your family, not only financially, relationally, but ultimately I think spiritually our families can be affected by this as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. Obviously, you know me, I'm not peddling anything from this. This is a free resource. Uh, it was compiled by a gentleman by the name of Steve Sandifer, uh, and I have never met him. I only know of him through uh, uh, my grad class I took on ministry and grieving, uh, and this was given to us. It's free, uh, and you can get it anywhere. Uh, we, for a while, we had it on our website, and I think we may have taken it off, but all you have to do is go to Google and type in My Love List. And this is the, the first one that popped up on my browser. Steve Sandifer, he is a chaplain or, or was a chaplain in the Houston area. I haven't caught up with where he is now. But I want to talk about why this is important. And there's a couple things that, that will outline it. Um, and again, this is I'm, I'm dabbling in an area that is not of my expertise. I normally talk about the spiritual side, but again, I, I think this affects... Uh, our spirituality. Uh, he gives a couple examples, and like I said, uh, Scotty could give some more. Uh, I'm sad to say that probably many of you can give some examples 
of, of what happens when people are unprepared and the ramifications of that. Uh, and so we're going to talk about kind of financially for just a minute, and I apologize if this is bothersome. And for those of you at home, I, I apologize if you, you know, you say I'm, I'm wasting your time. The good thing is you can hit one button and get up and walk away. For the people here, it's a little more awkward for them to get up and walk out, although you're, you're free to do so. We don't have anybody guarding the doors. But Steve Sam, Sandifer, he gives a, a couple examples uh, and one example is of a, um, I believe it's a, a man uh, who suddenly dies and all of a sudden his wife obviously has to take care of a lot of details and has to be done in a short amount of time. Uh, and in order to, to uh, execute the will and do the things that he wanted to have done, it was important for him to get a hold, important for her to get a hold of the will. So what does she have to do? Help me out here. She has to figure out where it's at. Where it's at. Okay. And so I want to say for all of those who have done your due diligence and you have done. And by the way, he calls it my love list because he says your family will love you if you do this. But if you do this and then hide this in a shoebox under your bed and tell no one, it helps no one. Because they won't find it for years later. And at that point, there's no telling what's going on. Uh, and so um, the, the woman has to find the will. Well, she does some guessing and she gets a little lucky and she learns that he has uh, a, a safety deposit box. Thank you. I just lost that word in the bank. OK, so um, she does not have a key to that will. So what does she have to do in order to gain access to that? What does she have to uh, show the bank in order to have access to that? Okay, she has to prove that she is the executor of the will, right? That she now has control of it. Okay, so do you know where we are? Okay, so she thinks the will is in the box. And if she finds the will, the will will tell her that will tell everyone that she's the executor and that she has access to get into the safety deposit box. But in order to prove that she's the executor who can get into the box, she first has to get into the box to prove that she's an executor. Now, again, there are ways around this, but all of a sudden, this makes it 10 times more difficult. In fact, I think, if I remember, I think they might have been on a trip, and so they had to... To, they had to rush back. They had to bring him back. All of the emotions of, of this taking place. And now she can't find the will. Now, it just so happens, as this story turns out, she's fortunate that she happens to know several people at her bank. And they agree with very close inspection to let her pull out the will out of the safety deposit box. And when they prove that she is in fact the executor of the will, then everything is okay. But if, if you don't have a couple friends down at the bank, or if you don't know where the will is, or if your sweet loving spouse who makes you coffee every morning didn't make a will or didn't tell you where it is, or it's 20 years out of date, all of a sudden, those next few days get a whole lot worse. Now let's talk about this as well. And this is a part that unfortunately are, is not unlike what many of us have faced sometime in our lives. That some of us have been George from Texas. And maybe it wasn't quite that drastic. But I have seen families who were basically disowned from the family show up before the funeral with a u-haul it happens it happens all the time and there are fights and there are items that are stolen and there is mistrust and there is division and a lot of that happens and I'm not saying it all of it will be avoided but if you take the time 
if you want to help your family, take the time and help your family understand what your wishes are. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a couple minutes. I want to be cautious, uh, conscientious of our time. Uh, but there's another example of why it's so important for us to be aware, not only of what happens after our death, but possibly even leading up in the, the days before our death. Uh, now, things have gotten a little bit better for, for many of us who choose to do online banking. Um, for a lot of us, we, have, um, we, we tell um, our bank to send money to, to these certain places every month, and that happens. Some of you may choose to, to still write a check, and let me, let me talk about why this is important. And I don't remember if Steve talks about this in his or uh, not, but I know we talked about it in our ministry to grieving class. Uh, there's a story of a, a, a man and woman, uh, and again, it was, it was the man who gets very sick, unfortunately or, fortunately or unfortunately, he doesn't die immediately. He remains in the hospital for an extended period. In fact, for several months, uh, he is very, very ill, can't communicate, and his sweet, loving bride is where? She's right by his side. And she's, she's with him every day. She's grieving. And she's trying to make do. And guess what she knows nothing about? The finances. And she doesn't know anything about paying bills. And one of the bills that the husband had been writing for every month for year after year after year was this little thing called life insurance. But guess what? He's in the hospital. And he's not paying that bill. And I don't know how often this happens. I don't know how they can get away with this. But there is at least one story that I've heard of someone while the man was in the hospital, unable to pay his bill, and his wife didn't know anything about it. After two months, his life insurance becomes delinquent. And when he dies... The, the insurance company claims that they don't owe anything because he stopped paying for it. Now, again, there may be ways around this, but at, at best, you're probably going to have to find somebody who's going to go and defend you, and you're going to have to have lots of conversations explaining why, and there may be loopholes in this, and there may be ways around it, but the bottom line is, if you haven't made loved ones aware of what's going on, you may say, I have everything prepared. I have life insurance. And if something happens to you and you don't have the way to keep paying for it, it could cause some issues. Um, I, I, am, I am thankful. I have both of my parents, and it, it doesn't really have anything to do with me mentioning this to them, but both of my parents have, have gone over and above to make sure that, that we all know what's going to happen. Uh, in fact, a couple weeks ago, uh, and this is odd because this is right before my dad got really, really sick. Um, he just said, hey, I want to let you know, I was uh, looking, I, I have one of my friend of mine who writes poems, and he wrote this uh, poem, and I really like it, and maybe it's something you want to consider reading at my funeral. Um, so he's, we've already had that conversation um, if, if I outlive my dad, one of my responsibilities is that I'm, I'm supposed to do his funeral. Uh, I'm supposed to officiate that. The, the, the same with my mom. Um, unless they call me later on today and say, I found somebody better to preach it. Um, yeah, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll get to sit and, and just sit there and weep. But, but that's, that's one of the expectations I have for me. Uh, my mom, and again, please don't, I'm not trying to sell anything. I just want to make you aware um, my, my mother, and I, I'm not even going to remember the right word for it, but is it called pre-needs? She, she's been to the funeral home. She selected her casket. She's, select, she's done all of that. She knows where she wants to be buried. All of that is on file. She's actually paid for it and everything. And so all we have to do is uh, get a hold of, uh, of a funeral company because she has one that can be used across the board. That's something you'll want to think about if, if you want to do something like this. Uh, she knows exactly where it's all going to be. And so we don't have to fight over it. And we don't, even if my brother's out, we wouldn't worry. About, I mean, we wouldn't be like, oh, it has to be the silver casket. But, but with all the things going on, the last thing I'm going to want to do is stand in a room 
And look at all these caskets while I'm grieving the death of one of my parents and say, okay, this is the one that I think that she would want. And, and this happens in that grief. You're not, everything becomes more important. And sometimes you can be in there and because you're not thinking, you're not in your right mind, all of a sudden, even though you think, well, this casket would be nice, you think, well, maybe I should get the one that's $3,000 more. And you, you convince yourself that you go out of your way to spend money. And, and if your loved one didn't say, I wanted this one, then you might be inclined to put yourself financially in a bad situation uh, because you're not really sure about it. Um, so what are some things that, that you can do? Uh, how can we prepare for this? Uh, I first off, I want to encourage you to get one of these. Um, I, I went ahead. I just made ten copies, but I mean it's I think a total of like fifty two pages if you include the cover. Uh, so twenty six pages front and back. You can't have this one because when I went to print my test copy, um, you have this page going this way, and then the next page is upside down. So if you really want to do it where you flip it like this, have at it. Otherwise, there's 10 back there. Uh, the second thing that I want to encourage you to do, if you want to use your own ink, uh, you can go home and Google my love list and you can print it off yourself. Uh, I would encourage you to consider uh, talking to your loved ones and saying, hey, will you consider doing this? One of the things that's, that's really neat about this, and we're going to talk about this, uh, is this this covers some areas that maybe you don't think about. Um, obviously, you know, there's there's the will and where is it located. Uh, oh, there's a lot of legal stuff in here that I can't pronounce. Again, I'm, uh, if you speak to an attorney, they're going to be tell, tell you, yeah, this is what you need to have. Um, but one, another thing I want to talk about is stuff. Um, you have stuff, Okay. relatively speaking, you have a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, you have more stuff than most people have in, in their little huts and they live in their third world country. Okay. And sometimes we think that's a good thing. M mostly it, it can become a big issue when your earthly tent dilapidates and you leave this world. Because all of a sudden you have a lot of stuff and people decide that they are entitled to that stuff. Um, I don't agree with a lot of things that uh, Bill Gates uh, uh, did, but one of the things he set up is a trust. And I'm, this is not a, I, I, I'll just say this, he created the, the Gates Foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, he's told his kids, you're going to get some money, you're not going to get all of it, you're not going to get most of it, because what Bill Gates and a lot of uh, very, very, very wealthy people have learned is that uh, unearned, expected income usually does more harm to the recipient than any good that was intended by the person who was giving it. And so Bill Gates and his wife have decided that they're going to give their kids some money, but they've created this fund and this fund, they, they're going to support a lot of things that I don't support or agree with. But, but I agree with the concept of um, don't let your family get caught up in what they're going to get or what they think they uh, deserve. I had a, a, a younger lady one time, she was telling me, I, I thought it was so wise uh, I was uh, visiting with her about some of the struggles that she had with a, a family member who just passed away. And it was, it was, I think, an uncle or maybe even a great uncle. But they had, they had some land and they had some wealth. Uh, and it turned into a feud. I mean, just all, like Hatfield and McCoys just fighting over who was going to get one. And one of the things she said was, you know, the will is kind of like the final report card you get from your parents. And in a lot of ways, what, what the child gets, they think is uh, a determination 
of how much they are loved. And that's one of the reasons why we see, see people fighting over mom's, you know, pearl earrings. The value of those earrings are a few hundred dollars, but for some reason, the person who gets them feels like they're more valuable if they're, actually, if they're the ones who had those. And so that's something to think about, um, is thinking about what you're going to give away. One of the things that, that you could do here is you can make a list of things that are important that you would want certain people to have. Uh, I think even better than this and I visited with, with someone else as we were discussing about, you know, all the, the arguments that have, have gone out over different things, um, even silly little things, um, is if, if you have something that's special that you want a loved one to have, give it to them, set them down, and tell them, I just want you to know I, this means a lot to me. And I really want you to have this. And so then you're not dealing with, well, I think they really wanted me to have it. Or, you know, I was at their house more than you were. And so I really deserve this. Um, you're not going to stop all the fights and all the arguments. But if you have something that means a lot to you, um, you know, I have the silliest thing um, from from my grandparents' house. Uh, when my um, granddad died and I don't know where he got this from I don't know where it came from the value of this thing is probably at a garage sale it might fetch two bucks but for some reason he had this little musical kind of well water well rig thing that you twisted a little thing and it would ding 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 and go up and down and as a child that was always something really neat and so when he passed away like that was something that was really neat I don't think it was really special to him but it was something that was special to me I think that was the the best thing that that I got and it was just one of those few things that, that meant a whole lot I, I, I still have that thing and it means a lot to me I, I think if if you have something that's that's special um, sit down with your family member and tell them how much you love them and tell them how much you, you they mean to you uh, and pass on that legacy and and let them uh, share that moment where they have something that's really special to them uh, and I wish it weren't this way but but jewelry and guns um, for some reason, we place we assign a value to them that's worth way more uh, than what they're really worth. And and again, I I have with my own eyes I've seen families fighting over who's going to get what jewelry. I mean, down to the costume jewelry, just fighting over this. Um, there are different ways that you can uh, try to avoid these things. Um, talk to your family about it. I know this is awkward. I know it's awkward for you to think what's important to me, but I, I've, there are some people in this room that I've had conversations with that have told me my family is torn to pieces because of a will and because of what people think they should have gotten. And it was kind of ambiguous as to what they really got. And so I just want to encourage you to do this. Again, there are 10 copies out there. If all 10 are taken, uh, I'll, I'll make as many copies as you want. You could go online, type in my love list. Uh, it's by Steve Sandifer. Uh, you can get a copy there. Fill it out. M date it. Make a second copy of it. and Or two or three copies of it. And make sure you give it to people and say, here's, uh, here's what's going to happen. Here's how I want it to be executed at my death. Uh, and I really think... Um, even though I, I pray that it's going to be years until your earthly tent um, is, is done with, I think you can make preparations that will help your family. I, I know that there's one family, if they could go back and mend some of, of the um, rifts that, that started since their death, if they could do it, they would. And so my encouragement is not wait until then. Again, I, I apologize if this is something that you didn't really want to discuss uh, because it doesn't seem spiritual. 
Um, I, I think it's going to be important. So grab a copy back there um, or go online and get one. Talk to your families. If you fill one of these out, please let other people know about it uh, so that um, the people who need to know about it so that you can um, they can find it and you can avoid some of that uh, turmoil that, that they're going to have to go through. So uh, we're going to finish with class uh, with a prayer. Uh, and then we'll be dismissed for this week. Father God, I just I thank you again for being a God who is is not surprised uh, about what's going to happen in our lives. In fact, a scripture tells us that you know the number of our days. And so, Lord, um, I, I thank you that the number of our days is not going to be counted uh, by the time here on this earth, but it will go on forever and ever because of the uh, gift of your son, Jesus. Uh, Lord, as, as Jesus was nearing the end of his life, he sat down with, uh, with his close friends and his apostles, and he shared with them how to go on after his death. And Lord, I, I pray that, that we heed those words uh, more than anything else, that spiritually that's the most important. But Lord, I also pray that, that we take measures uh, to, to help our families uh, uh, emotionally, and, and spiritually and financially after we die by, by preparing them for it, by reminding them that we have hope uh, beyond this world. Uh, and Lord, that hope is because of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I thank you again for being such an, uh, an awesome God and for loving us and for, for preparing for our death uh, and having a, a place for us. We thank you for that. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Okay, they're out on the Welcome Center if you want one. There's a stack of them. If they run out and you want one today, if I go back there this week and they're all gone, I'll make more copies. But you're welcome to go online and get one yourself as well. See you on Wednesday. What's up, bud? Hey, bud. Hmm. Hey, my froze on me. Oh, it'll it'll turn off itself. Yeah, yeah. I have it on a timer. Yeah, if you don't mind, you just leave it on, and that little white little disc thing will tell it to turn off in like ten minutes, okay. or maybe five. I will go ahead and hand this over to you. Yeah, yeah, let's see. I, don't know. I heard a little bit cutting out there at the end. Batteries were good last night when I checked them. It seemed to work okay. One other thing we might need to do is a small one for the cabinet itself. Okay. Uh, the guy and I was talking about it. We'd have to get a longer cord to plug into it, but then the amperage may overload. So we probably just need a, a plug in for the in the okay. by itself. Oh, okay. Oh, it's on outlet? Right. Put it on? Okay. Right. Okay. Because it's on an unprotected outlet right now. Okay. Did, did you try putting that surge protector on there? Not on that. Oh, okay. Every, it's got everything else on there. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. What well, seems to be working well. Hey, it so sounds better. It sounds good. We haven't had issues. I think it's been two or three times at least since we've had issues. I like it. I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Don't worry about that. 